Today on Impossible Engineering, the Rian and Tyrian Bridge, a colossal structure built in the heart of an earthquake zone. As we stand here, it can happen at any moment. Spanning two miles across open water, it took revolutionary engineering. A big part of the construction, it's underwater. And a look back at some hard lessons from the past. The energy release was massive, and now the specimen is just catastrophically failed. To make the impossible possible. August 2004, the Rian Antirian Bridge opens to traffic for the first time. It's an engineering masterpiece of the modern age. This massive structure spans almost two miles across the Gulf of Corinth in Greece. It boasts the longest fully suspended deck and deepest foundation piers of any bridge on Earth. For Chief Engineer Paniotis Papanikolas, it was the project of a lifetime. The bridge was something that always excited me, that one day maybe it will happen. But for centuries, building a bridge across the Gulf of Corinth was just a dream, due to a long list of environmental challenges. We are sitting now from the side of the Peloponnese, and of course it's the continental Greece. Years ago, those things were very close, and then they start drifting apart. There is tectonic faults all along this area, and uh, we are bound by mountains from both sides. And the geometry of these sections makes it as a natural wind tunnel. But wind isn't the only threat to the bridge. This particular strait here is uh, the highest seismic zone of Greece and the highest seismic zone of Europe. The two land masses on either side of the Gulf of Corinth are constantly drifting apart. This, along with frequent earthquakes, high winds, and deep water, meant that building a bridge across the Gulf would be a daunting task. But the need for a safe crossing was desperate. The perilous waters of the Gulf of Corinth often made ferry crossings impossible and cut the peninsula off from important services. There are examples of people that uh, lost their lives because uh, the ferries were not crossing due to bad weather and they could not come to the hospital. There was a need of this bridge. So in the 1990s, the government embarked on one of the most ambitious engineering projects in modern history. The first challenge was to design a bridge that could span the almost two-mile gap across the Gulf of Corinth. The distance was too great for a single-span bridge, so engineers had to build support towers in water that's over 200 feet deep. The cross-sections below sea level, we go to deep waters from the very beginning of the shore. No matter what type of bridge we want to select, we could not escape the depth of water. To overcome the water depth issue, Paniotis and his fellow engineers would need to look to history's great engineering innovations for the solution. Building in water has always been a challenge. Early builders relied on conveniently placed rocks for the foundation of their structures. Fine for lighthouses, useless for bridge building. Creating artificial islands was time consuming and impractical in deep water. In the 19th century, pressurized structures called caissons were developed to create underwater building sites. But they were difficult to build and dangerous. Fortunately, in the 20th century, a new technique was on the horizon. In the 1940s, engineer Guy Monsell came up with a solution that finally conquered the challenge of building at sea.
Professor Luke Bisbee is heading far out into the English Channel to see the remains of Guy Monzel's bold creation firsthand. Monzel's influence in contemporary engineering I don't think really can be overstated. This was really the first time that this had ever been attempted, and so it was really quite a daring feat of engineering. Monzel's innovation was triggered by the Second World War. It became clear the River Thames was a prime target for German bombers during the war. The Germans wanted to destroy London's docks and lay mines to disrupt Allied shipping. So Monzel came up with a radical new design for offshore sea defense. Naval forts, consisting of two 80-foot-high concrete towers, each containing four floors of accommodations topped with a gun deck. But the ingenious part of Monsell's design wasn't the layout of the fort. It was how it would be constructed and deployed at sea. Knock John here was towed out three to six miles from where it was constructed on land, uh, and then it was sunk in place, uh, out exactly where you see it. Monsell designed the bases of his forts as huge, hollow concrete barges. Despite their enormous weight, they had enough buoyancy to float. Monsell built the forts on top of these large concrete barges and then calculated how large the barges needed to be in order to hold the weight of the fort so they could be taken out and then sunk in place. The massive four and a half ton concrete forts were constructed in a dry dock, then towed out to sea with a 100 man crew already on board. Uh, when they had it in the place where they wanted it, they essentially just pulled out a stopcock at one end and let the water flow in. And as the water was flowing in, the barge started to list in the water. Eventually, the nose dipped under the water. All 100 men were hanging on as the fort was sinking at 35 degrees. Despite the rough submersion, Monsell's groundbreaking design worked perfectly. The bottom of the barge basically filled up with water, and eventually the entire barge sunk to the bottom and flattened out. Monsell's forts helped British forces shoot down 22 enemy aircraft and 30 flying bombs. They protected London from attack and made engineering history. The influence of this type of construction you can see in all different facets of engineering today. You can see it in the offshore oil and gas industry with oil platforms. You can see it being used as foundations for wind turbines. And of course, you can see it being used as a way of placing foundations for large bridge structures around the world. But the most impressive use of Monsell's revolutionary floating concrete design is at the Rian Antirian Bridge. The Rian Antirian Bridge spans an incredible two miles across the deep waters of the Gulf of Corinth. To support this massive structure, engineers used principles first exploited by Guy Monsell in the 1940s and supersized them. In 1998, construction begins on four enormous pier foundations. Each one is larger than a football field and weighs almost 80,000 tons. The hollow pier footings are built in a dry dock, just as Guy Monsell did, but on a scale he couldn't have imagined. Before the footings can be taken out into the Gulf of Corinth, engineers need a solution to a serious problem, a problem Monsell never had to deal with. The Gulf of Corinth lies in the heart of one of the most active seismic zones in the world. In an earthquake, the soft seafloor would liquefy, causing the piers to sink and the bridge to collapse. Unless an answer was found, the project was over. We had to find the solutions how to reinforce the subsoil in order to be able to handle those weights, those big structures, and also to withstand the earthquake. The engineers came up with a radical solution. 
They would drive hundreds of long tubes deep into the soil where the four piers will sit. Imagine the foundation being like a yogurt. It's like uh, having yogurt and uh, you put stores inside to enforce them. This ingenious idea stabilized the soft seafloor. The pylon are the elements that at the end of the day will take most of the part of the earthquake. It is the pylon responsibility to take those loads down to the foundations. Bridge footings are usually anchored directly into the ground, but for the Rian Anterian, they were placed on top of a 10-foot layer of gravel. This allowed the footings to shift with the earth during an earthquake. Very innovative design, first time done in engineering, first time done in this bridge. But without this solution, it would have been impossible to build the bridge. With a solution to the earthquake problem, the engineers are now ready to begin one of the most audacious parts of the build. Maneuvering the half-constructed piers into the gulf. Engineers continued to build up the massive structures while they were still floating. We are exactly in the area here where this portion that I'm sitting on is the one that was constructed in the dry dock and wet dock. And from here and further up, it was constructed in situ, right here at, at this location. Each layer of heavy concrete that was added sunk the pier further down, pushing it closer to its final resting place, 200 feet below on the seafloor. The end result was four enormous hollow foundation piers. They're the first of their kind, a series of massive concrete underwater caverns. The pier footings for the Rian Anterian can survive an earthquake, but what about its nearly two mile long suspended deck? The wind, it's a phenomenon which is predictable. Earthquake is something different. The builders of this massive structure will need to produce even more impossible engineering. The Rian Anterian Bridge in Greece is a modern engineering marvel. Over 11 million cubic feet of concrete, more than 100,000 tons of steel, and 39 miles of cabling make up the longest fully suspended cable stayed bridge on the planet. Paniotis Papanicolas and his fellow engineers had to overcome a long list of obstacles before their dream of a bridge spanning the Gulf of Corinth could be realized. The Gulf of Corinth is one of the busiest trade routes in Europe. Its shipping lanes cannot be disrupted. Of course, what you try to do is uh, to find the closest possible part of the strait, eh? so to have the smallest possible bridge for, for economical reasons. But of course, we had to respect uh, the navigation channels. To design a bridge capable of spanning this gap without interfering with shipping, engineers would need to turn to the great innovators of the past for inspiration. It was the Romans who first engineered solid bridges, using stone and a simple but revolutionary shape, the arch. However, the wider the gap, the more arches were needed, and the heavier the bridge became. For hundreds of years, Inca communities in the high Andes crossed gorges using suspended wooden walkways. It's said that 16th century Spanish conquistadors arriving in Peru looked in amazement and fear at the swaying bridges that could break at any moment. It wasn't until 1826 that a brilliant engineer utilized new building materials and a new approach to change the bridge game forever. The Manai Suspension Bridge is the ultimate achievement of Thomas Telford, one of Britain's finest civil engineers. 
Telford was an accomplished engineer, of course, at this stage. He had designed canals and roads and bridges. He'd never built anything on this scale before, and so this bridge was to be really his greatest challenge. The Menai Strait separates mainland Wales from the island of Anglesey. Centuries ago, bridging it would have been impossible. A traditional Roman arch design would not only be enormous, it would block the passage of tall ships along the waterway. Imagine this as being the strait here, and these are the, wall, the valley walls on either side of the strait. Basically, you, you cut your bits into shape, and you then have to gradually build your arch, adding the bits of the arch as you go. And if you imagine that as now being the completed arch, and we have our load coming along here, you can see that the compression forces that come from that car flow down through the various sections of the arch and into the abutments on either side of the valley. Now, the problem that Telford faced was that as you're building an arch, you would have to have some supports down here underneath the middle of the arch so that as you're building it, the blocks don't fall into the strait. And that would require some scaffolding. And this was just not acceptable um, to the Admiralty at the time because this is a very busy shipping channel and they required 100 feet of clearance above the high water mark. And that led Telford to have to consider something that could give him a very long clear span with no supports in the water, even during construction. Telford's solution was the world's first major long-span suspension bridge. For a suspension bridge, we need two very strong abutments, and then you need two towers. Uh, and then what you do is, once you've built your towers, you take a cable, like these guys, and you string these up and over the towers, and then you drop hanger cables down from the main cables, and then put your bridge deck in place. And then once your bridge is completed, uh, if you have a load that comes along, say our, our car here, it comes along, and now when the load gets out near the middle of the span, the load from the car then gets transferred up through the hanger cables into the main cable up over the tower. The tension in that cable gets anchored in these strong abutments and the compression force here goes down into the, the foundations in the bedrock. Well, that's essentially how a suspension bridge works, like this beautiful bridge we have here. Telford's suspended deck was a stroke of engineering genius. The key advantages of a suspension bridge are that you can span long distances with no supports below the bridge deck. So you can get very long, clear, unsupported spans because all of the support is coming from the suspending cables and the main cables up above you. So below the bridge deck, there's absolutely no obstructions, which in a straight uh, is obviously a very important thing. A suspended bridge was the obvious solution for Papa Nicholas and his fellow engineers in the Gulf of Corinth, but they would have to do it on a much larger scale. The Rian Antirian would need to be an incredible seven times longer than the Menai suspension bridge. Unlike the main anchored cables of Telford suspension bridge, this cable stayed design would use individual cables radiating from four huge pylons spaced 1,600 feet apart. Each cable set would support a 40-foot section of the bridge's deck. In 2003, deck building begins. Each section is floated out into the Gulf of Corinth and attached to either side of a pylon until the decks meet. This massive operation took more than a year to complete. Just as they had to do for the bridge's pier footings, designers had to ensure the deck could survive an earthquake in one of the most active seismic zones in the world. The wind, it's a phenomenon which is predictable. So you are ready for it. You have designed the bridge to take it. Earthquake is something different. Expansion joints allow the deck to stretch as the two land masses on either side slowly drift apart. But protecting it against a massive earthquake will require a groundbreaking new approach. What you see is a deck just going through the pylons, does not touch, does not sit on the pylons. This one has this unique feature of the full suspension deck. Instead of resting on the foundation piers, the deck hangs just above, creating a single one and a half mile long, fully suspended floating deck. When an earthquake strikes, flexibility will be key to the bridge deck's survival. 
The piers can move on their foundations, and if the deck was attached when this happened, it would buckle and break. But it's also important that the deck doesn't sway during the frequent high winds experienced in the Gulf of Corinth. Engineers had to ensure rigidity in normal conditions, but flexibility in the event of an earthquake. Their solution, the world's biggest shock absorber. They are similar with the shock absorbers that we have in the cars. They allow some movement, but what they do mostly, they absorb this energy. If the bridge begins moving erratically, a fuse breaks, sending the massive dampers into action. The moment that the fuse breaks, the small tube can get inside the large tube. At that point, the, the dampers come into action. This device does not work for years. And then one day, you want it to work, and everything has to be perfect. So if it was something too sophisticated, usually the moment you want them to work, they don't work. This quake-busting design proved its worth four years after the bridge opened, when a 6.4-scale earthquake hit the Rian Antirian in 2008. The innovative damping system kicked into action, saving the bridge from disaster. But earthquakes aren't the only natural forces that engineers will need to overcome. We are like inside the wind channel here, so there is always, always wind. The thing is that as you go higher and higher from the sea level, the wind's getting higher and higher, the wind, the wind speed. To ensure the Rianantirian survival, they'll need to take a look back at some of history's great engineering catastrophes. Designers of the almost two-mile-long Rian Antirian Bridge faced huge environmental challenges. In one of the most seismically active regions in Europe, cutting-edge technology was developed to protect the bridge from earthquakes. But the bridge faces another equally destructive environmental threat that its engineers must overcome. We are like inside the wind channel here, so there is always, always wind. The thing is that as you go higher and higher from the sea level, the wind's getting higher and higher, the wind, the wind speed. To protect this massive structure from wind, engineers will need to take a lesson from the history books. When the Tacoma Narrows Suspension Bridge opened near Seattle in July 1940, it was thought to be at the forefront of bridge design. But it wasn't long before the bridge got the nickname Galloping Gertie. There was clearly a very big problem. Just four months after opening, the bridge's twisting motion became so violent it suffered a catastrophic failure. Crashing almost 200 feet into the water below. An investigation found that the relatively light 40 mile per hour wind was hitting the solid edges of the deck, creating an unstable oscillation that fed off itself, amplifying to the point of disaster. The wind conditions are far more severe in the Gulf of Corinth. The mountainous landscape creates a funnel where winds of 70 miles per hour are common. The aerodynamics of the bridge deck are a crucial element. One of the solutions is to put Furrings, spoilers, the same thing on a fast car, you have the spoilers underneath uh, just to improve the aerodynamic shape of the fast car that, that drives through the wind. Here is the wind drives through the bridge. The fairings safeguard the deck from gusts of over 150 miles per hour. But the massive cables holding up the deck also need to be strong enough to survive extreme wind gusts. The designers of the Rian Antirian looked to an engineering marvel created years ago for the solution, one that conquered a challenge once thought to be impossible.
In the second half of the 19th century, the growth of New York City was being stunted by the limits of the East River. At that time, the only way for people to cross from Brooklyn to Manhattan was by ferry. You see here Manhattan uh, to my left and Brooklyn to my right. At the time, you could imagine just a river teeming with boats. But in 1867, boat traffic ground to a halt. A cold spell actually froze the East River over and essentially halted commerce because you could walk across the East River at the time on the ice, but you couldn't actually trade. So it was at that point when voices really kind of mounted, demanding a, a permanent kind of structural connection between the two cities uh, with a bridge to have this lasting connection so that you could have reliable transportation and uh, trade. The man given the job was German-born engineer John Augustus Rubling, and what he designed still inspires engineers today. The Brooklyn Bridge. Just the concept of actually spanning over such a long distance at such a height was earth-shattering. No bridge had been built even close to this span. The Brooklyn Bridge spans over a mile, it was made possible by Rubling's use of a revolutionary new material, steel. Just thinking of actually building a bridge, not of masonry as you would find in kind of traditional European style, but saying we have this new material, steel, we will build it, the entire deck and the cables of steel. This is an absolute engineering marvel. Steel is stronger, lighter, and more flexible than iron. Rublin used this new material for the bridge's four massive suspension cables. He bundled hundreds of parallel steel wires together, creating super strong and super safe cables. Engineer Adrian Brugger demonstrates just how much safer Rublin's design is at Columbia University's engineering testing lab. This cable is made up of actually independent small five millimeter circular wires. In this case, there's 9,000 wires. Those wires are then grouped into what we call strands. You actually take those and you can pack those into the cable. This is a kind of a huge leap from the technology we had before, because before what we had was more or less serialized systems, such as uh, chains or these large eye bars, where if one of these eye bars failed, generally that meant that the entire bridge failed. If one of these wires happens to be bad or has a crack in it, then the entire cable still has 8,999 other intact wires. Adrian compares the system used on the Brooklyn Bridge to those that came before it using a giant universal tester. And more or less, a universal testing machine just means that it's a machine that is built to crush things and rip them apart. First to be tested, a solid steel bar. This will be very similar to what you would have on a, an old bridge, pre-Brooklyn Bridge, for example. The steel bar has been weakened at a specific point and will be stretched under massive tension to simulate a bridge failure. So we expect this bar to fail at around a good 200 tons. Right now you can see the necking is starting at about a quarter up from the reduced section, so exactly where we wanted it. Uh, and it'll become more and more pronounced kind of as we see it now. The energy release was massive, and now the specimen is just catastrophically failed. It's broken. Such an explosive failure could result in the collapse of a whole bridge as tragically happened with Silver Bridge in Ohio, causing the loss of dozens of lives. Next, Adrian tests Rubling's steel cable design. As it's stretched, he subjects it to extreme heat to weaken it, simulating a fail. So we are seeing uh, this cascading failure right now. You can see each wire is actually breaking one after another. It's not just as one catastrophic failure, but rather this cascade. When the cable starts to fail, the remaining wires take up the load. Even if all the wires fail, the energy released is gradual rather than one huge explosion. 
So what you saw there was, you know, exactly why the suspension bridge wires are such a great solution. But you can see that you didn't have this one catastrophic explosion and just failure of the member, but rather each one of these wires actually broke. Steel technology enabled John Rubling to design what was at the time the world's longest and strongest bridge and an engineering masterpiece. This bridge would eclipse every other structure in the entire America, so it would be the tallest structure anywhere. So just a person actually standing on the tower would be on essentially the first skyscraper in the United States. The designers of the Rian Antirian Bridge will need to supersize the revolutionary ideas of John Rubling and the Brooklyn Bridge. This type of oscillation would be very worrying to the designers. The structure could collapse due to oscillations such as this. And create even more impossible engineering. One hundred eighty feet above the Gulf of Corinth, cutting-edge suspension technology, inspired by Brooklyn Bridge designer John Rubling, keeps the ultra-modern Rian Antirian Bridge from crashing into the water. Every cable is made by individual strands. They are parallel. Strand is fifty millimeters diameter, more or less. Each strand carries more or less the same load. The only thing we do as the cable get bigger and bigger, we put more and more strands from 37 strands in the small cables up to 73 strands in the longest cable. But unlike New York City, near hurricane force winds are common in the Gulf of Corinth, putting a great deal of stress on the cables. At a wind tunnel facility, Professor Luke Bisbee demonstrates just how destructive wind can be. All right, so we're going to start it up and we'll see what happens. If this were the cable in a real bridge, this type of oscillation would be very worrying to the designers uh, because what this would mean is that the, the metal that forms the cable would be being stressed repeatedly back and forth and eventually in a metal cable that can lead to fatigue which can cause cracking and hence potentially failure of the structure. So the structure could collapse due to oscillations such as this. When wind strikes a cylindrical structure like a cable, it separates, then rejoins on the other side, causing the structure to oscillate, a phenomenon known as vortex shedding. Vortex shedding has been responsible for the collapse of several chimneys and towers over the years. In 1957, British scientist Christopher Kitt Scruton discovered that adding a simple fin to a cylindrical structure would break up the wind vortices, reducing the vibrations that could lead to a collapse. He called the fin a helical strake. seeing a little bit of vibration here, um, not too much. Oh, this is really incredible that this simple spiral can completely prevent the motion of this simulated bridge cable. With the helical strake, we get this disruption of the flow pattern, we introduce some turbulence, um, and both the, the formation of the vortices and the vibration of the cable both stop. The helical strake seems to be working. Since Kit Scruton invented the helical strake back in the 50s and 60s, it's been applied to tens of thousands of structures and chimneys and bridges around the world and has really saved them from potential catastrophic collapse due to wind effects. Helical strakes are integrated into all of the nearly 40 miles of cabling on the Rian Antirian Bridge. This, combined with spoiler-like deck fairings, makes this bridge one of the safest on Earth. But a bridge can't just be functional, it has to be beautiful. So once again, engineers will look to the innovations of the past for inspiration. Concrete is often having a bad name and people think it's an ugly material. This application here proves that this has not to be the case.
The Rian Antirian Bridge in Greece is a wonder of the engineering world. Its designers not only had to ensure it could survive earthquakes and high winds, but they were also forced to construct it in extremely deep water on unstable soil. Underwater, the bridge may be an enormous mass of concrete, but above water, it has to be elegant and add to the Greek landscape around it, not scar it. Finding the right balance between strength and beauty was quite a challenge for the engineering team. A challenge that may have been insurmountable had it not been for the great innovators of the past. In 1928, renowned Swiss civil engineer Robert Maillart won a competition to design a bridge that would link two remote towns, 300 feet above the Salgina Valley in Switzerland. The result, the Salgina Tobel Bridge. Designated an international engineering landmark, Maillart's bridge proved to the world that concrete could be both practical and beautiful. Engineer Urs Meyer has been a lifelong fan of the iconic structure, but he's about to see it from an entirely new perspective. Up to now, I have seen the bridge from the deck, from the side, admiring the bridge and now I have the chance to see the arch very close. I'm very, very happy. From here, I really can appreciate the structure. From this location, we have a very nice close-up. Nobody else can have. Mayor was a master in designing such slender elements, like columns, like arches. It's a dream, this position. I never realized that it's so beautiful, so slender. Must have been fascinating, dramatical to build such a bridge above this gorge. Mayer was the very first who realized the potential of steel reinforced concrete and this here is his masterpiece. Building a bridge in this remote part of eastern Switzerland required great ingenuity. We live here in a wonderful environment, but more often there is storm here, there is snow, there are avalanches, there are landslides, and Maillard had to face all these dramatical challenges uh, to construct this bridge. Concrete is strong in compression, but reinforcing it with steel bars also gives it strength in tension, allowing it to be manipulated into almost any shape. Myart designed an elegant three-pinned hollow box arch supported by reinforced concrete columns. This made the concrete strong enough to transmit the bridge loads to the foundations, but flexible enough to absorb any ground movement that could cause dangerous cracks to form. Maillard's sleek design also used less reinforced concrete, making it cheaper to build. But there were some skeptics. At that time, there were no similar bridges of this size. People did not believe that this would work. But Maillard had already such an excellent name, not only in Switzerland, also abroad, that they trusted him and said, OK, go ahead. When the Salgina Tobel Bridge opened in August 1930, it was hailed an engineering and artistic triumph, proving to the world that concrete bridges could be both functional and beautiful. Concrete is often having a bad name, and people think it's an ugly material, ugly application. And this application here proves that this has not to be the case. 
Meyer proved that design of a bridge is art. A thousand miles away in Greece, Maillard's influence can be seen all over the Rian Antirian Bridge. The four reinforced concrete pylons embody cost-saving minimalism, flexible strength, and elegant design. So from the bottom, it's huge. And as we go towards the top, we try to make it more elegant for aesthetic point of view, but also for saving of material and for saving of mass. At different locations of the bridge, you'll find different types and different qualities of concrete. The higher the quality, the more expensive it is. 780,000 tons of reinforced concrete ensure this bridge could survive an earthquake of seven on the Richter scale. You start the four pylons that you see, and then they connect at the top to the pylon head, a very critical element that takes the load carried by the cables to the top. The Rian Antirian Bridge has redrawn the map of Greece, and its designers have rewritten the rules of bridge engineering forever. Floating a huge sack of 80,000 tons for months and keep building it in floating positions or transporting this structure or putting at the right location, meeting the last piece of the deck or the doping span, these things look impossible. And then uh, as long as you keep walking and get closer and closer, then you see you can be close to the millimeter when, and they fit together. By modernizing innovations of the past, and making groundbreaking discoveries of their own. The engineers and designers of this incredible structure have succeeded in making the impossible possible.